Good evening. Uh, my name is Vyacheslav Morozov. Um, I'm uh, the program chair for the Tartu conference on uh, Russian and East European studies and the uh, professor of uh, EU-Russia relations uh, here at the University of Tartu. It is with mixed feelings that I'm opening the fifth annual Tartu conference on Russian and East European studies. On uh, the one hand, I miss the anticipation. This afternoon, I would have uh, been walking to my office uh, knowing that uh, many dozens of colleagues, all the new friends, have already arrived in Tartu, and uh, I could meet any one of them uh, at any moment. Alas, you are now joining uh, this plenary session uh, from uh, your hometowns, um, and uh, we won't have a chance to meet in person this time. On the other hand, this conference, um, this year's conference, uh, with um, around 350 uh, registered participants is larger than ever before. Uh, and uh, people are joining us from all over the world. Uh, when we discussed the idea of an annual event in Tartu with our colleagues from the universities of uh, Uppsala and Kent, when we were preparing uh, proposal for the uptake consortium, what was to become the uptake consortium. That was more than six years ago already. Um, our most daring ambition was to bring together, let's say, around 150, maybe 200 people, but uh, we have consistently been over uh, 200 for this conference. And uh, this year's event um, is a special uh, not only being online, but also in the sense that it's the largest so far. Um, um, we are also proud to um, have received the first ever uh, prize for uh, the promotion of international cooperation uh, from the um, International Council for Central and East European Studies. And uh, I take it as a sign of uh, recognition of the work that we do here, all of us at the Johann Institute of Political Studies of um, uh, University of the University of Tartu and at the UT's uh, Center for Eurasian and uh, Russian Studies, which is uh, the home of this conference. Um, so I'm very grateful to my colleagues at CEVUS, uh, Miley Wilson and Olga Bogdanova, uh, as well as uh, to uh, all the people who have contributed uh, to this year's event, Aina Beitane, Barry Hood, Victoria Kozlova, and uh, the entire team of volunteers who will be working behind the scenes uh, tonight and through the next two days to make sure that, we, that everything runs smoothly. Uh, special thanks to my colleagues from the program committee, uh, Dr. Ep Annus and uh, Professor Henry Hale, uh, Professor Hale is also uh, a co-director of the Conas Eurasia uh, Academic Network based at the George Washington uh, University in the United States. Uh, and uh, Conas Eurasia has been the core organizer of the conference this year. So special welcome to my uh, fellow Conas members, including today's plenary speaker, Asher Zarakoy. Um, from me as a program chair, I would uh, very much like to thank those of you who um, agreed to serve as uh, chairs and discussants at this conference. I know everyone is tired of online conferences and it's very difficult to take up an additional obligation and to commit um, oneself for an entire uh, session and uh, also reading the papers and um, trying to contribute to the discussion. But uh, believe me, this is very much appreciated every time, uh, not just by us, but also by the authors of uh, those papers. And of course, many thanks to all of you, uh, all of those who have submitted their proposals, uh, especially to those who have taken part in this conference repeatedly for uh, many years. Uh, it's good to have you with us today. Uh, even remotely, and um, I'm very much looking forward to uh, the upcoming discussions tonight and also tomorrow and uh, on, uh, on Tuesday. This conference 
has been supported financially by the United States Embassy in Tallinn. So uh, the next speaker at this uh, session, uh, who comes to us for the pre-recorded video, uh, will be Carl E. Stolz, a US diplomat uh, whose career has been devoted uh, to the promotion of public diplomacy and citizen exchanges. Um, uh, including uh, he, his career included the position of uh, the director of the State Department Office of Citizen Exchanges. And his uh, most recent placement that um, ended somewhat unexpectedly was as uh, counselor for public affairs at the US Embassy in Tallinn. Uh, so uh, uh, now I uh, give the floor virtually to uh, Mr. Stolz. Thank you, Dr. Morozov, for that introduction. And I would also like to thank the University of Tartu, the Center for Eurasian and Russian Studies, and the Ponars Eurasia Network for the invitation to speak to you all today. I would also like to thank Dr. F. Andus, Dr. Henry Hale, Dr. Olga Bogdanova, and all others who have worked to bring uh, scholars together this week for this important gathering. I know that the U.S. Embassy in Tallinn has a strong relationship with the University of Tartu, and I'm very happy to be a part of this partnership. Today, June 6, is not only an important date because it is the beginning of this conference, but it is also the date that the United States of America and its allies opened the Western Front on the continent of Europe during World War II, beginning with D-Day 77 years ago and culminating in the defeat of Nazi Germany less than one year later. Just as many countries allied together then to achieve a common goal, today we are working globally to overcome the effects of the COVID pandemic and restore a world where we can all travel to international conferences freely, interact with one another in person again, and benefit from the exchange experiences that come from those opportunities to experience other cultures and hear other points of view that differ from our own. Alas, I fear that as we emerge from one pandemic, we are at risk of entering a new one, a pandemic of self-imposed isolation, as some countries now find it easier to restrict space for civil society and expand restrictions on independent academic and media voices than to return to a more open world. I have experienced that issue firsthand, because until two weeks ago, I was the Minister Counselor for Public Affairs at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow where I was responsible for all of our academic exchange and media programs across Russia. But I am now speaking to you from exile in Washington, D.C., as one of many American and other diplomats recently expelled from Russia. Despite that personal experience, I have not given up on Russia. And I know from reviewing your own academic backgrounds and the topics for this conference that neither have any of you. While the United States of America remains clear-eyed, about Russia and in firm opposition to its divisive rhetoric and malign actions in many countries, we also remain ready to engage. And we are eager to listen to Estonia and our other close partners and allies as we seek to understand how policies will affect the region and how we can move forward together. The U.S. Embassy in Tallinn and the entire Department of State values your efforts through conferences such as these to broaden and expand opportunities for international understanding and to add additional international perspectives on the region. We are sad to see Russia threaten the continuity of valued exchanges and scholarship programs with its recent legislative and regulatory changes, which expand the scope and applications of its restrictive foreign agent legislation in a blatant effort to further excessively monitor, regulate, and restrict the activities and freedom of expression of members of Russia's civil society, as well as Russian academia, independent media, political opposition, and other independent voices. The clear intent of these measures is to promote an atmosphere of increased fear and self-censorship. We're also sad to see Russia's decision to withdraw its delegation from this summer's Finno-Ugric World Congress. This is just another example of Kremlin-led effort to cut ties with other countries and to reduce the scope of discourse in Russia. What the world needs right now as we emerge from our pandemic-induced bubbles 
is more dialogue, more interaction, and more openness. Just as Hitler's Atlantic Wall did not keep the Allies out of the Third Reich for long, creating a foreign agent wall around Russia will not benefit the people of Russia, nor would help us overcome our many global challenges together. Estonia and many other countries of Europe show how cooperation and openness benefit their own people and the entire world. So I want to thank each of you for your role as independent voices, raising the questions that need to be asked and collaborating with others to find solutions. As the American uh, minister and civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King once said, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. And hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Thank you for being the scholarly lights that drive away darkness and for being the lovers of internationalism that overcome those who would use disinformation to foster hatred and more isolation. I wish you the best of success in this conference and I look forward to reading about its significant outcomes. Thank you very much. Our next speaker in this opening session uh, is uh, Professor Henry Hale, uh, who is a Professor of Political Science and International Affairs and uh, Co-Director of the Program of New Approaches to Research and Security uh, in Eurasia, Polnas Eurasia. Uh, Professor Hale uh, knows this region inside out. He spent extensive time conducting field research uh, in post-Soviet Eurasia. And uh, his uh, work has received uh, recognition from uh, American Political Science Association and uh, been published uh, in, uh, in the leading journals in the field. We just had a, a quite a stimulating workshop with uh, Polnars Eurasia colleagues yesterday as part of the pre-program of this conference. Um, and um, um, I'm, very, I'm very glad that we had the chance to co-organize this conference with uh, Polnars. So Professor Gale, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you, Slava, for the kind introduction. Um, I'm happy to represent uh, Ponars Eurasia, uh, which stands for the Program on New Approaches to Research and Security in Eurasia. Um, on behalf of um, all of our members and uh, my co-director, uh, co-director together with me, uh, Marlene Laruel. Um, and um, I just wanted to say a few words about uh, Ponars Eurasia and uh, why we're happy to uh, uh, contribute to the uh, Tartu conference this year. Um, Ponars Eurasia's mission is uh, twofold. Uh, first of all, to uh, work to improve uh, scholarship uh, through bringing together scholars from across the world who share research interests on um, globally important um, policy relevant issues in the, the that are uh, that affect the post Soviet um, uh, space, uh, broadly speaking. Um, and we do this through um, a, a few methods. Uh, first of all, through organizing and co organizing um, events uh, like the workshop that uh, uh, Slava just mentioned, um, and also working together with existing institutions um, and events such as the Tartu Conference, which we're happy to uh, contribute to. Um, uh, this uh, weekend in the coming week. Um, we also try to uh, not only uh, improve each other's scholarship by bringing scholars together uh, from across the world, um, but try to uh, work to mobilize uh, the, the findings from this scholarship for a broader international policy community. Um, and basically, as we know, uh, academics often don't have particular uh, incentives to um, make their research findings known or relevant to um, uh, broader policy interested audiences. Um, and uh, just as, as political scientists, for example, in my case, uh, we're definitely not trained uh, to do this. And so uh, what Ponars tries to do is to work with um, scholars uh, to um, bring out uh, the interesting aspects of their findings uh, based on research for um, relevant uh, topics of the day uh, in the form of uh, policy memos, which are short uh, research-based policy papers of about 200 wor uh, 2,000 words. Um, uh, we've also recently launched uh, the Ponars Eurasia Online Academy, where you can find um, short, you know, roughly 10-minute uh, videos where uh, leading experts on the topic, uh, on various topics, um, explain 
uh, and uh, you know give information on topics that might be uh, that might fit well into uh, courses or lectures, for example. So we recently had um, we recently have, have videos on um, issues like Russia's regional diversity, um, uh, the Arctic uh, as it pertains to post-Soviet Eurasia and so on, as well as podcasts. Um, and blog entries. Um, and you can find these materials if you're interested at ponarseurasia.org. Um, we are uh, sponsored by, um, of course, George Washington University and its Institute for European, Russian, Eurasian Studies, where we're based, uh, and uh, Carnegie Corporation of New York, which provides the bulk of the, the, the funding for um, uh, these activities. And so I just encourage you, if you're interested, um, what, well, while uh, some of what we do um, is uh, based on uh, who is a member, uh, uh, a lot of it is not. So we invite you to submit uh, proposals for research-based policy memos, um, blogs, um, which we, we review on a rolling basis if you're interested in publishing your research and helping it get um, uh, known and noticed in a, in a broader uh, international kind of policy interested community. Um, and we also invite you to apply for membership. Uh, un unfortunately, our uh, funding situation uh, keeps us limited to uh, scholars based in either broadly post-Soviet Eurasia or North America. Um, that may change at some point. Uh, and, and even if we, uh, uh, even if you're not able to apply for membership, we hope that you'll, um, you know, be in touch with us and engage us because uh, we often like to hold events on different themes around the world where we want to bring in all kinds of scholars, regardless of whether or not one is a, a member or not. Um, and uh, because of the mission that we have to work to help scholars improve each other's um, uh, scholarship, as well as to um, you know, kind of help mobilize it for um, uh, a broader consumption, uh, we're very happy to uh, cooperate uh, this year with uh, the Tartu Conference. Um, again, this was in the works uh, for a couple of years, didn't happen last year for obvious reasons. Uh, the Tartu Conference, I think, is just a wonderful example of a uh, event that brings together a diverse group of scholars from all over the world um, to exchange ideas and perspectives, therefore improving each other's work. I think it's established itself in relatively short time as one of the premier events in uh, the professional uh, life, uh, certainly as um, you know, professional gathering uh, for people who work um, in a wide range of disciplines on um, you know, Russia and uh, Eastern Europe uh, broadly conceived. So uh, we're very happy to be involved. I'm just sorry that we can't meet in person, as was the original idea. Uh, it's always better, but um, I think Zoom and uh, other other you know kind of online platforms do have their advantages, and so it can be we can bring in people who couldn't otherwise travel. So we look forward to a vibrant discussion over the next uh, today and the next couple of days. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Henry. Um, so this brings uh, the official opening to a close. And uh, now it's um, time for the plenary session. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, a good colleague and old friend, uh, Aisha Zarakol, uh, who is a reader in international relations in the political science department and a fellow uh, at Emmanuel College at the University of Cambridge. Her primary research interests are in international security and uh, more specifically, she works on the evolution of uh, East-West relations uh, in the international order, declining and rising powers and uh, the politics, uh, politics of non-Western regional powers. Uh, she is the author of After Defeat, How the East Learned to Live with the West, published at Cambridge um, uh, in uh, 2011. And uh, more recently, Hierarchies in World Politics, uh, also Cambridge University Press uh, 2017. Uh, and this latter book was uh, runner up for the uh, ISA uh, Theory Section Prize in 2019. Uh, Dr. Zarako is also currently an associate editor of the Journal of Global Security Studies, a serious editor for the Palgrave Studies in International Relations and section chair for historical international relations a section of the International Studies Association. Um, her most recent article, or maybe not the most recent, but the most, most recent major article co-authored with uh, Rebecca Adler-Nissen uh, appeared in the international organization just um, a few weeks ago, I think. Um, and um, in this article, uh, they explore 
the struggles for recognition that uh, undermine uh, the liberal international order, both uh, from within and from without. Um, the title of uh, Aisha's talk is um, What Makes a Region a Region? The Future and Promise of Area Studies. A very pertinent title for an area studies conference, I should say. Um, I, uh, before I give the floor to Aisha, a technical note. Uh, please note that in this session, and only in this session, this is different from the panel sessions uh, tomorrow and Tuesday, uh, the audience will be able to ask questions in written form only. So we encourage questions from the audience, of course, uh, uh, but uh, for this, please find the conference agenda. It should be on the right side of your browser. And there is a Q&A button under the session. And please write your question or comment there. And um, I, as uh, the moderator, will uh, pose them to Dr. Zarko. I hope that is clear. And uh, without further ado, I, I do I give the floor to Aisha. Welcome. Thank you, and thank you, Slava, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, I should just add, this shows that I should update the bio on my website. I am no longer <laughs> an associate editor uh, at JOGS, but the, the rest of it is, uh, is, is true. Uh, my term came to an end uh, about a year ago. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, at this, well, virtual conference. Of course, I too wish that uh, we could be together uh, in person. Uh, I visited Tartu, I think, um, seven or eight years ago uh, as part of a PONARS uh, conference. Uh, I am also a member and I want to echo what uh, Henry said. It is a wonderful uh, organization. Uh, I joined when I, I was still in the US uh, and uh, I learned a lot. Uh, from Ponars, from other members. So uh, <laughs> everything Henry has said is true. I encourage everybody uh, to give it a, a look. Um, and yeah, I wish <laughs> I wish I could be. We could all be in Tartu in person. But uh, since we can't be, we have to make the best of the circumstance. Uh, and um, I thought today I could uh, talk to you a little bit about something I don't necessarily work on. But something I think about a lot: <laughs> what uh, what makes a region a region, and also, you know, maybe celebrates the fact that we're at an area studies conference uh, because I think these are special spaces which this conference promotes and also Ponars promotes. And maybe I can talk to you a little bit about um, uh, what makes them <laughs> special: these these uh, gatherings. But before I do that, one one more. Um, Plug. Uh, I, my colleagues uh, at the Center for Geopolitics at Cambridge, they saw that I was doing this talk and they asked me to, uh, to advertise also that they, uh, they have started a Baltic geopolitics program. Uh, this is uh, the Center for Geopolitics actually uh, has a similar mission, I suppose, to PONARS in the sense that it uh, aims to bring uh, policymakers and academics together. So if this is something that interests you and if you're interested in Baltics as defined <laughs> here um, with maybe like a more British uh, perspective twist, uh, please check out <laughs> the Baltic geopolitics program at the University of Cambridge, which has been just launched. Uh, so with that out of the way, uh, let's get back to the topic uh, of the day. Uh, so I call the talk what makes a region a region because it's uh, it doesn't sound good <laughs> to say what makes an area an area, but really I want to talk about uh, area studies. Um, and uh, as I said, this is not you know my specialty. You know, area studies uh, far far from it. Uh, but uh, through some twists of fate, <laughs> I, I, do an, I did end up uh, on, for instance, the editorial board of the new journal for area studies, and I'm asked to review stuff uh, that has to do with area studies. So it's something in my mind, and of course, it has uh, my work overlaps with this uh, notion of area studies in ways that I will describe in the uh, next minutes. Uh, so. Um, 
yeah, let's, you know, let's uh, <laughs> together think about uh, this, uh, this question, what makes a region a region. Now you are at a conference for Russian and Eastern uh, European studies. Uh, and uh, on, on the one hand, I guess, you know, it's, <laughs> it's obvious <laughs> which countries would be under that heading. Uh, but at the same time, it's not so obvious, right? So when I, I just try it out, I Googled the term uh, Russian and East European studies uh, and different maps come up, uh, put up by you know, universities like University of Tartu or Northwestern and so on. So I think this one is from Northwestern. So this one uh, is the most, I think, literal <laughs> map. So it has uh, Russian, uh, Russia and uh, Eastern European countries, uh, but other maps that came up, you know, in Google image search um, uh, was, you know, this one, for instance, I think it's more the former USSR plus, uh, uh, you know, Iron Curtain country. So it has a more expansive definition of what would be under that heading. I don't exactly know, uh, Slava will have to tell us after I'm done, which de definition that this conference uh, is operating with, but I, I would guess something maybe more uh, along these lines. Uh, that's also, I think, Ponars, or, uh, but you know, I, I'm in Ponars, so, so uh, how, <laughs> sometimes you also get this map. This is called Eurasia. Um, so this is everything plus Turkey. Uh, but again, you know, how do we draw these borders? Uh, it's not clear, right? Why isn't, for instance, if it's Eurasia, why isn't Mongolia in there? You know, so that we can always pick at, you know, why, why is this map, this map and not some other map, which is why is this country left out and this country included, right? People have different definitions of um, uh, what, uh, what this area consists of, even though we kind of know we can feel around it. Uh, we would know who would who would not belong, but it's more debatable who, <laughs> who does belong, especially uh, uh, on, on the margins. Uh, and I think it's more the case with uh, an area like Russian um, and Eastern European studies, because it doesn't necessarily, even when we call it Eurasia, it doesn't follow, uh, follow the contours of a geography that seems natural to us. Uh, of course, all geographies in some ways are constructed, but this one seems to have more, you know, porous <laughs> geographical boundaries. And, you know, um, some other regions can point more to linguistic or ethnic uh, co commonalities. And of course, some of it is here as well, uh, but uh, there is much more diversity, I think, in this particular area or region than compared to some other regions. In any case, those are relatively constructed 19th century categories to begin with, right? So it's not like if we could somehow find a linguistic tie, that would be the obvious object of study. And of course there is, you know, the, I think the best candidate, right? Um, is uh, history, shared history, shared experience. Uh, again, going to the second map, the experience of, you know, USSR and uh, it, the sphere of influence, the second world, you know, these, uh, institutional, normative, cultural experiences that transmit and still shape uh, choices and behavior and uh, identities. And it's interesting to, you know, study them together. I think that would be an obvious defense of this area or region. But then some people will say, you know, <laughs> it's been so many years already, it's time to move on. Why are you hanging on to this, you know, uh, <laughs> 20th century kind of uh, experience as like the defining future, right? Uh, and I think we need to come up with an answer to that. Uh, why is it worth, you know, holding on to these shared experiences? Why is it worth studying them uh, together? What are some of the ways we can, you know, as you may know, depending on where you are, but uh, area studies, especially in the US, but I think also in, in the UK and other places have been under, um, you know, criticism for, some years uh, underfunded. Uh, um, there is an argument, especially in, in my field, international relations or bro more, more broadly political science that we don't need area studies, right? <laughs> so I think we need to have you know, good defenses of, uh, of thinking about the world uh, in this manner. So recently I reviewed this book, uh, which I thought was very good. 
uh, the rebirth of area studies uh, edited by Zoran Militinovic. Um, and I'm not sure why I got, I got the book to review, but I found it interesting <laughs> because I've been thinking about these issues. So I will start where they start and then I'm going to add my own spin to, uh, to the discussion. Uh, and uh, the introduction to uh, this book, uh, written by also by uh, Militinovic, uh, is, uh, uh, summarizes the charges against area studies, especially in American academia. Uh, and uh, I think that's a good point to start, you know, what people think about area studies, people who are against area studies. So one, one uh, charge is that, you know, we shouldn't be doing area studies because these are, this is too descriptive, it's almost journalism. Right, there is really no theory uh, and people who do area studies who are experts in their area, in their country, like the country that they study, uh, they're not really contributing to you know, theory building, which, is the, which should be the goal of um, social sciences especially, right? This is a charge that comes, I think, especially out of social sciences. Uh, there is another critique that you may find more in uh, humanities and humanistic uh, uh, social sciences that area studies are too complicit with you know power dynamics that they were a creation this this is something that you, you hear and the book also addresses directly that they are a kind of a creation of cold war or even before that you know maybe colonial era and therefore that they, they are suspect you know they they are tools of power uh, I think anthropology especially like uh, has dealt with uh, this kind of reckoning uh, you know, the um, anthropologists in area studies have uh, dealt with this kind of charge. Uh, so should we be doing area studies if this, this is just serving um, imperial or neo-colonial visions, right? That's one charge coming from a different <laughs> angle. There is, uh, there is the charge that area studies, you know, they're kind of like, you know, um, a basket of all sorts of you know disciplines and approaches. There is no specific method or even a clear object, as I was saying. You know what is a region, and therefore they should be abandoned, and we should go to our disciplinary corners where methods can be better evaluated. And uh, another charge, I, I think, summarized by Militinovic, is that uh, there is no point of doing area studies anymore because globalization is homog homogenizing the world. Uh, and you know the distinctions are becoming uh, trivial, and therefore uh, uh, we can look at the, the whole world. I think you can find this, especially in, for instance, my field, international relations. A lot of uh, studies just do you know big uh, big stats. The whole world is essentially you know a database. There is no reason to make um, allowances for uh, distinctions between geographies and cultures. So these are some of the charges uh, which I want to address. And the, this book also addresses if you're interested in these questions. Uh, but I want to talk about in this, uh, uh, in this time that I have. And of course, you might, you know, <laughs> I should address the fact that I am a little bit of a strange advocate uh, for <laughs> area studies. Uh, you know, why, why am I defending area studies? Uh, I come from, I'm originally from Turkey. I grew up there uh, before I moved to the US and then later UK. And, you know, growing up in Turkey, it's a place, I mean, I think it's, this is true about many countries, but I think it's, it's especially true for Turkey that it's not clear which area or region Turkey belongs to, right? It's always used as like the example um, par excellence of like a liminal country, is it? Is it in Europe? You know, is it in the Middle East? Is it in Eurasia? Uh, so I grew up, you know, not knowing which, or the Balkans, uh, which region uh, to be oriented towards, like many Turks. Uh, this, of course, you know, um, I think Russia and many Eastern European countries have similar dilemmas, but, um, and also su suspicious of, in some ways, you know, um, traditional area studies that, that you know, had erected um, very um, seemingly well-defined borders. Uh, so for instance, you know, the concept of the Middle East, I was always somewhat skeptical uh, of. And in my, in my first book, I deliberately tried to, to circumvent, you know, the various boxes 
that uh, that you know Turkey was being put in by comparing it to uh, this is the book that Slava mentioned that came out in 2011 uh, by comparing Turkey to Russia to Japan uh, three countries that wouldn't be you know traditionally compared or contrasted because they seem to belong in different <laughs> regions or areas. Uh, and in fact, in the beginning of my career, I had difficulty uh, publishing articles because they, I mean, one time one reviewer said with my first article, which was comparing Turkey and Japan historical crimes, they said, we cannot find a reviewer <laughs> who, who, who feels competent to evaluate <laughs> the article because it has both uh, Turkey and Japan. So in, in some ways, I am a strange person to make the case for Eric studies, but I will make the case because as a result of this book, uh, and I think uh, as a result of maybe this amorphous, ambiguous place that uh, Turkey occupies in the world, I've been invited since that book was published to a number of like different settings. I walk through many rooms, including, you know, Ponars, uh, talking to <laughs> um, specialists of, you know, as I am doing now, Russian and Eastern European studies, Mediterranean studies, Middle Eastern studies, um, through the Mediterranean, there's an extension even to Latin American studies. So I've been in many, many different rooms and I find that some of the best conversations uh, I, uh, are to be had actually in <laughs> area studies, conferences, workshops. Uh, I mean, these are places where people really know what they're talking about. Uh, and I think something would really be lost if, if the, the space was flattened in the way that you know, anti-area studies uh, people advocate. Uh, so I, I, as a result, I have become an advocate of area studies, you know, a particular kind of area studies that is open and it's open to having conversations, not you know, this bounded box of you know, the Cold War years maybe. Uh, so, um, so that's where uh, you know, I'm coming from. And as a result, I do agree with you know, the arguments that Milin Turnovich and other authors in this uh, book uh, make against these charges. Uh, and let me summarize what they are before I, I add my own. So for instance, you know, this claim that area studies too descriptive and capable of theory building, uh, Milin Turnovich and others in, in this volume say, well, theory building requires context. You know, you cannot have theories unless you know, you know or somebody <laughs> is pro producing uh, you know, this, and it's not in, to imply some kind of hierarchy between, you know, one or the other. There is this assumption also in social sciences that, you know, theory sits at the top and uh, expertise is somewhere at the bottom. But actually, they, they, they need each other. They, it's a completely, you know, symbiotic uh, in, in some ways relationship. Uh, and you cannot have one side without the other. I think of myself as primarily a theorist these days. I'm going to talk about my forthcoming book um, uh, later in this talk, uh, and you know it just would not be possible uh, w without um, without this knowledge production about, about areas, regions, uh, histories. Uh, so um, that's a kind of a silly, <laughs> silly argument to make. And the claim that you know area studies too complicit with power, implicated in you know Cold War uh, dynamics. Um, and, you know, imperialism as such, uh, Milutinovich says, and I agree, that all, all fields of study, you know, they, every field has its own historical sociology, and, the, you know, none of our disciplines are natural things that exist in nature. They have been produced by various power dynamics. Uh, international relations, my field is the way it is, it comes out of the U.S., it comes out of, you know, you know certain kind of US great power thinking. Of course, you know, we have to be aware of these histories, but it's not, there aren't fields that are not implicated uh, in uh, power dynamics. Even, I mean, it's, it's true for the sciences also. So uh, it's again, kind of a spurious charge against uh, area studies. Uh, and the, the claim that area studies lack a specific method or a clear object, they're too interdisciplinary. That is a strength, not a weakness. I will say more about that in, in a moment. Uh, and uh, in terms of um, you know, the argument that forces of globalization have made area studies unnecessary because differences are now trivial, 
uh, that's also, <laughs> I think recent events have shown, first of all, that globalization is not some kind of teleological process that's, you know, continuing uh, un <laughs> interrupted. It's more, you know, ups and downs. Uh, and, you know, uh, globalization is not new, but one can believe that there are globalizing processes and that still uh, hold some kind of uh, middle ground in, to, <laughs> to study and focus where interesting insights and um, uh, understandings are to be found. And I will say more about that uh, in a moment as well. So um, the two things that I want to talk to you of, uh, in the remainder of the talk are these, uh, these claims, uh, which I'm going to give my own spin beyond what's in this volume. Uh, interdisciplinarity and methodological pluralism uh, as a strength and globalization uh, and implications for area studies and especially for Russian and Eastern European uh, studies. So inter the first point, interdisciplinarity and methodological pluralism. Uh, we live in a world <laughs> where disciplined, I mean, we're encouraged to, you know, everybody says, uh, let's be interdisciplinarity, but all the incentive structures that we have uh, from publishing to promotion actually punish interdisciplinarity uh, because it's very difficult uh, for, you know, when people are evaluating your kind of work, if you're publishing in other fields journals, your colleagues don't know whether that's a good journal or not. It's difficult, every field that has its own jargon, uh, it's very difficult to do it, if you, even if you were willing, right? So all our university incentive structures are uh, built in a way um, that actually almost punishes interdisciplinarity. And at the same time, you know, methodological pluralism, again, it's everybody says that's a good idea, but uh, we've become so, uh, I think part of, as a, as a result of these uh, evaluation structures, uh, methods have become uh, much more central to what we do, especially in social sciences, but in general, I think, you know, history archives and so on, where so much work is evaluated just based on, you know, its methodological contribution. Actually, it's it's become also difficult <laughs> to be truly methodologically uh, pluralist. Uh, so that's kind of the gray, you know, <laughs> uh, the the structure is forcing us to be not interdisciplinary and not methodologically pluralist. I think area studies are kind of a defense against that, <laughs> the structural force. It's, uh, and I think this is a really good thing. Uh, uh, and let me make the case by giving you two examples as to why this is a good thing. You may have heard, uh, I, I mean, I didn't go to MIT, but I read about this. This is something uh, that's known, but maybe some of you have gone to MIT and uh, you, know, you know this. There used to be a building <laughs> at MIT, uh, Building 20, which when it was demolished, as you can see in 1998, people gathered to commemorate this building. It was actually a very ugly building. You can see uh, in the photo, uh, the, it's the three, um, uh, um, I mean, four uh, building structure had been um, constructed in 1943. It was supposed to be a temporary building, but it ended up uh, housing a number of different disciplines together and because it was kind of a temporary construction it didn't have very well defined halls and doors and whatnot so <laughs> um, it was a place where disciplines kind of mi in, uh, uh, mixed and mingled in, in a way that they don't do in a modern university campus and then later you know I think there was such an explosion of uh, co creativity uh, and contribution from the disciplines that were ho housed in that building that people later look back uh, and said, you know, wh why was MIT such an innovative, <laughs> creative place? And they thought, many people, the answer was Building 20. Uh, so for instance, linguistics, Noam Chomsky, that's, you know, that big move that changed the field of linguistics. It was partly because you know he was uh, at, in the same place with computer scientists and people who wouldn't normally talk to each other were having these hallway conversations, and as a result, all the disciplines ended up you know kind of having <laughs> new ideas. So this is kind of a well studied, I think, case of you know if you bring people from different disciplines together, 
uh, the results are generally better if they're, they're just like in their own narrow corner, uh, you know, debating how many angels can dance on the pin, pin of a <laughs> head of a pin. You know, that's that's usually what we do when we get into our jargon and uh, you know paradigm wars. This same thing, you know, the Oxbridge model. This is my college, Emmanuel High Table, and it's it's easy to you know make fun of this, and you know it's Harry some colleges the Harry Potter style. And it's old fashioned <laughs> and it's always odd to me you know, when, when I go to high, high table, but there's something really beneficial about high table, which I think is why everybody's in favor of maintaining this tradition in some form is that, you know, if you sit at the, that top table, that's where the fellows sit, you sit with fellows from other disciplines. Uh, this is, we, we can go have lunch there. We can also have, uh, you know, dinner um, and, I've had some of, you know, uh, I've had amazing conversations uh, at, at lunchtime with people, you know, in entire different in zoology. And there's something really um, productive about the way, about how, about being forced to explain what you're doing in a way, in a way somebody from another <laughs> field will understand. And then, you know, hearing about what's happening in those other fields also gives you uh, a sense of, you know, uh, what may travel or what may not, or some, you know, blind alleys each discipline go down on, <laughs> those become apparent when you talk to people from other fields. So I think, you know, area studies, um, the concept of area studies, and even a conference uh, like the one that you're about to embark on, uh, it's one of the few places, you know, outside of MIT Building 20 or Oxbridge, you know, which, you know, uh, where actually this is kind of uh, not only encouraged, but also kind of, you know, pe people who do area studies are uh, part of these interdisciplinary conversations uh, naturally. So I just looked through the program uh, uh, for the conference in the next two days, and I can see you know, of course we don't have scientists here, but still there is an interdisciplinarity. You know, you can, you can go to one panel about, you know, populism, then some, something about security and then art and uh, media and uh, disciplines that wouldn't not, not naturally, you know, talk to each other. Um, although they are doing similar and overlapping things are in the same space. And of course it's even more so when you're physically present and you may end up having you know, chance conversations and so on. I think that's very important and something that shouldn't be lost. And in fact, very, very much uh, vigorously defended because it's one of the few corners in academia where this is still possible. Now, this other point, uh, and with this, I'm coming to a cl close, I, uh, I promise. Um, uh, the charge that you know globalization has made area studies unnecessary uh, and i think you know as i said russian and east european studies is particularly sensitive to this charge especially because so much of eastern europe is now you know in the eu so you could say why, what's the point <laughs> of keeping this old distinction um uh so i think there's an answer to that as well a, a strong positive defense. Uh, and for that, I'm going to take you on a little detour. And the little detour involves a plug for my forthcoming book. So it's also self-serving, but I, <laughs> I promise it will, it will come back to this issue of uh, area studies. So my forthcoming book is called Before the West, uh, Rise and Fall of Eastern World Orders. It's uh, in production now. So I'm hoping it will be out um, later this year uh, from Cambridge, uh, so please consider buying it, but that's not why, <laughs> why I'm <laughs> talking to you about it. What I did in the book, I'm not going to get into the theoretical arguments in the book, but what I did in the book was to challenge the, the teaching of history and international relations, again, my, my field, which goes something uh, like this, you know, you have the Peloponnesian War and the Greek city-state system, and then nothing happens. Then we got <laughs> to Westphalia in 17th century. This is when you know European uh, society of states, this European state system, is formed according to the traditional narrative. Uh, and then we have a bunch of events in Europe, like you know Congress of Vienna, and then the system becomes uh, global. 
uh, World War One, World War Two, Cold War, Fall of the Berlin Wall, 9-11. These are, this is the schematic version of IR history that <laughs> many of us have been challenging uh, as long as we've been uh, in this field. And then of course, you know, the, the history of international order is taught something like this. Europe creates regional order, exports it to the rest of the world. Uh, and the rest of the world is imagined as kind of being in silos, doing nothing, like having no international <laughs> relations, at, at, at most maybe a little bit regional relations, until Europeans come along in essentially 18th, 19th century and incorporate other parts of the world into this international order. Uh, I've grew <laughs> uh, over the course of my career, I became, um, you know, very dissatisfied with this historical narrative, as many of us are. But the problem is you can criticize the narrative for being Eurocentric, but unless you replace it with something else and offer an alternative, it just kind of lives on as kind of like the zombie version of itself. It keeps taking hits. Uh, this is Eurocentric, uh, but it just stays, you know, because there's no other kind of grand narrative. Uh, so what I wanted to do in this book is I wanted to write a history of the East <laughs> in addition to this history of the West for international relations, for um, people to draw on. I, I have certain theoretical goals uh, in doing this, um, uh, but which I'm not going to get into, but I was focusing in the book on world orderers uh, in, in the East. I had to think about, you know, what is the East? What is Asia? What is Eurasia? So I, I, I kind of deal with those concepts in the book if, if you're interested, but uh, because um, IR history has so much focused on international order builders. Um, I wanted to do the same for the East and focus on uh, what I call world orders of the East. So, um, you know, I start in the book uh, with, the, <laughs> with the empire of Genghis, Genghis Khan in the 13th century, which I argue has, you know, created, made Asia or Eurasia as a, a coherent space in the same way <laughs> that the Roman Empire did maybe for uh, Rome, you know, uh, bringing under the same sovereign regions that were not <laughs> under the same uh, political ruler. And then in the book, I kind of trace, you know, the sovereignty model uh, uh, that was kind of distilled and um, diffused in this period. Uh, as well as a number of institutions and norms, again, uh, starting from this period, I traced them down centuries uh, in different parts of Asia or Eurasia. So, uh, you know, um, I look at the Khanates, then I look at uh, what I call um, uh, post Genghisid order, the Timurids and the Ming. It's not so important, uh, but you know, just to give you a sense, uh, and then I look at the, the Ottomans, the, uh, the uh, the Safavids and the Mughals as uh, kind of um, being legacy states. And then of course, you know, Moscovy and <laughs> the Uzbeks and even later Ming and also talk about how these models influenced Europe. So I, I trace the, the influences of a 13th century empire all the way to the 17th uh, century. Uh, as kind of a world, a, a different kind of world order building with its own institutions and norms and replace kind of the, the IR traditional narrative of Europe emanating outwards with a, a, a complementary <laughs> narrative of, you know, different um, orders emanating out of Asia uh, and Eurasia. So that detour, apart from being a plug in my book, <laughs> all of that, uh, I, I, you know, I, I walked you through that to make the point that if I can show <laughs> the influences of uh, like the political, normative, cultural, um, institutional influences of a 13th century empire for <laughs> several centuries afterwards, even to this day, you could do it. But uh, you, one can certainly <laughs> say that uh, this experience, this shared experience of 20th century will continue and reverberate, you know, th through many more decades. You know, I don't, I think it's, <laughs> it's a really strange claim to say uh, for those who say it, that, you know, it's been on, it's been <laughs> uh, 30 years, it's time to move on or 40 years, however many years has it been, sorry. Uh, I'm old, so like time, time has no meaning, but um, yeah, so, I think 
and if if we don't trace those institutions and norms and you know the the legacies of imperial structures and you know uh, power um, uh, dynamics and so on, then we we lose. I think really something important. I think maybe the most important dimensions of uh, how politics and how uh, how societies function. You know, I think it's through these you know legacy structures. Um, and of course, I mean, it doesn't mean that we should be open to other types, uh, we should be close to other types of comparisons, but there's something really important there and really defensible. And I think something very important, uh, meaty, uh, that we should hold on to um, in Russian <laughs> and Eastern European uh, or post-Soviet or you know, Eurasian uh, studies. Uh, one last point. So that's, I think, generally true for other area uh, as, as, as well um, that have these shared uh, experiences to be traced. Uh, but there's, I think, an additional reason as to why Russian and Eastern European studies is especially productive and as it should be especially defended. Uh, and I think it's no accident, for instance, going back to this book I mentioned, The Rebirth of Area Studies, when I look at the, the, the contributors uh, and all the chapters are really good, most of them are actually working or have a background in uh, Russian and Eastern European studies. Uh, so I think there is uh, there's an additional uh, reflexivity, I think, to Russian <laughs> and Eastern European studies for the reasons that I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, because there is this, it doesn't seem, as I said, like a naturally bounded area. So people think more about <laughs> why it's, it's still an area. Uh, and also, um, you know, this is an area that has been, I mean, East and West, again, are not, you know, trans historical categories, but to the uh, point, to the, uh, as long as they've existed, let's say, for the last um, five centuries or so, maybe, maybe longer, um, the area that you're in has been, <laughs> has been at the intersection of East and West. So I think that reflexivity and hybridity, right, of different kind of influences, uh, and the fact that scholars who work in these areas have to be reflexive and have to think about uh, that that the hybridity, that liminality. Um, I think together that's a, a recipe uh, for insight, <laughs> insight and creativity, right? Not taking for things for granted. Uh, it brings an almost natural, uh, not natural, but it, it pushes um, the scholarship in interesting, innovative, um, novel theoretical directions. Um, and I think that's why, you know, uh, this, this, <laughs> this conference, especially of all the area studies, uh, is an especially um, great space for thinking, and I hope you'll enjoy the next two weeks. Uh, not, not two weeks, two days. <laughs> I'm sure I will. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Well, thank you very much, Aisha. Uh, that was an excellent defense of um, area studies, I would say. Um, um, and um, I very much like your personal take um, on uh, why uh, you ended up doing this and why you ended up engaged with uh, area studies. Um, actually, I uh, often assign your uh, your introduction, the introduction to your your previous book, the 2011 one, uh, which is also very personal and explains why on earth you decided to do this study, this comparative study, um, uh, in a in a very personal way, right? You write that uh, you were at some point surprised by uh, the, uh, the the Turkish reaction. I think it was uh, to Orhan Pamuk, right, and his uh, his um, um, statements and uh, how you. Uh, found yourself puzzled with uh, with this uh, this uh, reaction and tried to explain it for yourself and uh, this is how the whole book came about. Um, I think this is this is this has been an experience of many of us uh, in this um, conversation and I certainly can testify that my way into area studies uh, has also been like that. That. Um, I was at some point puzzled uh, by something that I saw in my own country um, and uh, then tried to put it into context and try to figure out what to do. Um, so we are still waiting for questions and let me repeat uh, how to 
do how to ask questions in this session um i just need to go to the agenda in uh, your browser window uh and uh, then uh, it should be on the right and then under the under today's session you will see uh the q a button questions and answers button and then you can type your questions in the chat right there uh, but while we are waiting for um, the questions, uh, let me try to engage a little bit with um, your, um, I share your uh, point about uh, area studies being involved uh, with power, in particular with uh, colonial power. I think it's um, it's not just uh, in a way a birthmark, or not not something that uh, has to be one has to be ashamed of, but also. It's something that, in a certain sense, makes regions, right? Because, uh, yeah, we do have legacies. Uh, it's a problematic concept, of course, and there is a tendency, on the one hand, to constantly explain everything away as part of legacies. You know, these people are like that because they are post-socialist people. They are civilizationally incompetent and all that. But um, at the same time, we should, of course, acknowledge the fact that um, the space we live in has been shaped by uh, the previous orders. And uh, for most of um, any place's history, probably, in, um, at, at least in our part of the world, for sure, this was um, an imperial order. And this imperial order actually shaped the infrastructure, it shaped transportation routes, it shaped uh, uh, people's placement, it shaped uh, the space around us. And in that sense, um, of course, looking at um, colonial legacies, imperial legacies, uh, legacies of power uh, as it displays itself in, uh, in space and, and through time is actually quite important. Uh, and uh, uh, in that sense, there is, there, is, there is actually another identity issue, I think, for both of us that, uh, that comes up here. Because I, I've been all, quite often after my uh, previous book um, on Russia's post-colonial identity, I have been identified with post-colonial studies. And I'm, I, I often get invited to various events to speak on behalf of post-colonial studies. But at the same time, I don't find myself fully integrated with that crowd because I also see certain uh, weaknesses in uh, the post-colonial optic. Um, and, uh, at the same time, I definitely support the idea of applying post-colonial studies and post-colonial paradigm in general to uh, the post-Soviet space and to the post-socialist world in general, because I do think that uh, colonial legacies quite often, I mean, imperial legacies and colonial legacies um, cannot be completely differentiated. And we cannot say that, you know, um, in, let's say in, in Ukraine, we only have imperial legacies, whereas somewhere in Africa, we have colonial legacies. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, these uh, legacies are multi-layered and very complex. Uh, what is your relationship to post-colonial studies? How would you define your position vis-a-vis uh, -vis that field? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I am also, you know, sometimes associated with post-colonial um, studies. Uh, certainly, the arguments that I have made about, you know, stigmatization and social hierarchies, there are a lot of parallels, uh, um, and I think there, there there is a lot of great work that's being done in post-colonial studies. Um, I've co-authored with people from uh, those uh, backgrounds. Um, I'm I didn't. You know that that wasn't my <laughs> formation. So I, I am operating more in you know social theories of stratification. Um, so yeah, so I similar I guess to you. Um, I'm friendly, but uh, it's not my home. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, yes, that that's that's my attitude as well. Uh, but uh, one thing that I sometimes find problematic about uh, uh, post-colonial studies and, 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 and especially the decolonial turn when it comes to the classroom in particular is uh, uh, relationship with the um, sort of classical literature in, um, uh, in, let's say in IR, that's particularly problematic, right? Because what we have in IR as a canon has been created by white males 
And um, our attempt to diversify the, uh, the, the curricula, for instance, well, I mean, yes, I, I think we are all trying, uh, we're all doing our best, but there are certain limits to, 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 to the, I mean, in the extent to which it can go. Um, so um, in that sense, I think that it's important to still teach the canon somehow, but probably as um, not something that has to be taken for granted, something that has to be memorized and, uh, and, uh, uh, and taken as the final truth, but maybe as something that has to be deconstructed by using the more contemporary optics. And this is where the, the uh, uh, post-colonial and decolonial turn is very, very important and very useful, I think. Yeah, I mean, I don't teach IR theory these days, but when I used to, I taught it more like, here's the <laughs> historical sociology of the discipline. You know, here's what the conversation was here, and then some people said this, and other people said that. You know, I try to create it, as, I mean, teach it as like a long conversation. So the paradigms are not, you know, existing uh, out of time. They are products of, <laughs> of their time. Uh, and the universities as existed then and the field as existed then. Um, I mean, so how I study the world is how I also teach the discipline. Um, yeah, so I mean, in, in response to what you said, the two points that you made, um, I guess, you know, in terms of legacies or, you know, post-colonial stuff sometimes becoming tokenist and so, so on. Uh, I mean, my, my general approach is relational. So in, anytime, anybody takes an, uh, an approach that seems to reify like existing categories or uh, positions or identities. Um, I have difficulty with that. I, I think we need to understand things as relational and products of particular relations and sociologies at a given time. Um, of course, easier said than done. It's hard to study the world like that. It's much easier if everybody was like fixed, but um, we do what we can. Okay, questions start to come up. Um, it took some time, but uh, now we have quite a few. So I, I'll go by, by, one by one for the time being, but then, then we'll see. Uh, the first one came from Prajakti Kaura, uh, who thanks you for an interesting talk. Um, says, uh, I look forward to reading your book. Um, uh, I also work on the significance of the processes begun in the 13th century for Eurasia and something that is a counterpoint to the West as understood as uh, uh, Western European. My question is, which IR theory you use in your work to explain this space without attracting the usual criticisms of being understood as anti-Western, or if you do get those questions, how do you defend your position? Hmm. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, it's a, it's an excellent question. So I'm, I'm not use you know, I'm not operating in the book with an IR theory as such, like realism or this and that. I mean, I, as I said, my approach is relational, which, you know, roughly constructivist, I guess. Um, but, um, I don't, I'm not wearing it like a, with, as a neon sign. I mean, in this book, I'm particularly interested in rethinking the concept of sovereignty and order. Uh, so I challenge those debates in IR and, and dec also decline, uh, decline of, you know, powers or, um, you know, de decline of orders. Those are some of the debates I intervene in. Um, and uh, in terms of, you know, am I anti-Western? I have an epilogue in the book. <laughs> I don't know if you saw it. It's, it's the subtitle is like, am I a Eurasianist? <laughs> so I do, I do address that, um, as uh, directly in the book, and of, I am I am not. Uh, and I, I try to write a history that didn't privilege any. I mean, I try to write a history that did not privilege European actors, as it normally is uh, done. Um, and the story doesn't start just when European actors come to the scene. I try to see the world as the major players of that time would see it, uh, and those major players of the time have some have been some of them have been claimed by present day actors but they are actually different actors you know that <laughs> that claim is like a modern day projection back into time so uh i yeah th these are issues i i thought about um and i mean one of the points i make is i'm not anti-western because in a way like well, i'm showing that order making is not just a western thing but at the same time i'm showing 
you know, if you associate international order making with coercion or, you know, imperialistic practices, I'm showing that the same existed also in the East. So it's not, you know, owned by any particular uh, culture or civilization. These are some processes that, you know, occur <laughs> if the sociological conditions are there. Uh, so, yeah, I don't think I'm anti-Western. Um, I'm just trying to fill out the big picture with parts that are missing. Of course, it's a, it's a long journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I don't think the question was uh, in any way implied that you were anti-Western. I think it's... Uh, no, 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 yeah. we, we've, all been, we've all been in that situations, of course, when, when we have been accused of being anti-something and uh, sometimes both, actually. That's, that, 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 that's quite nice when you get uh, in the crossfire, of course. Yes. The, the best situation you can imagine. Um, right, um, a question from, uh, from Vladimir Kuri. Um, um, if one reason for keeping Russian and East European studies is to be able to trace the legacy of the Russian Empire and the USSR, doesn't this mean prioritizing one of the many legacies of particular reg countries, regions, localities, or others? If so, is it justified? And related to this, why should Russia still be featured in this historically and geopolitically diverse area? And by the way, before you, you, you answer, I, uh, this reminds me that I actually didn't answer your question about how we define the scope of this conference. Well, um, in fact, we don't. We just throw in this, um, this uh, designation, uh, Russian and East European studies, and then let people define it for themselves. And uh, as you might have seen in our program, we have, um, especially starting from about two, three years ago, we started to get proposals regularly uh, and in large, relatively large, large numbers on Central Asia. Turkey has always been in. I'm not sure this year there's been, there, there is anything on Turkey, but Turkey in general has been in, definitely. And at the same time, of course, the Baltics are in, unlike in the first map that we showed. Um, and also um, uh, Central and Eastern Europe is largely in as well. So I think people just define it for themselves and it, it's the most inclusive definition that um, you can imagine. Mongolia, I think, has never been there, but I think it's most because of uh, the fact that very few people specialize in Mongolia. But okay, uh, so why do we have to deal with Russia then? Um, I mean, I think that's <laughs> that's more of a question for you. But uh, I mean, no, I, I mean, I did say I think these imperial um, or you know great power, I guess, a modern day this, uh, parlance legacies are important. I mean, I wouldn't say if somebody wants to create another version. I I, did, I wasn't making a defense where it's like it must be this. I just think there is a very good reason to study this. But hopefully, other constellations are studied as well, so it wouldn't. But at the same time, I'm mean, com coming back to this. You know, there are particular so sociological or historical reasons as to why these fields exist uh, that have to do with you know logistics and funding. Um, they are not by themselves good enough reasons <laughs> to to, um, to keep doing it, which is why I was saying we need a more positive defense. But if if the structures exist to study it this way, there are also good. Um, scholarly reasons uh, why why one should keep doing it this way is what I was saying. So I wouldn't say all all area studies must you know have Russia in them, but if you do already have it in, I think there is still a lot that can be mined from having that particular con con constellation uh, and combination. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, actually, uh, indeed, this probably is a question to me uh, because I've been emphasizing this, uh, the, the importance of legacies also in, 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 in my interventions today. Um, and I guess my answer will, will be similar to yours. This is what I do, um, and uh, I am interested in, um, uh, in uh, the role Russia plays today in, in this area and elsewhere in the world, and I'm also interested in uh, how history of the Russian Empire has shaped this part of the world and how uh, the imperial order itself um, um, uh, played a role. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's, a, it, it's basically up to the scholars who come from other backgrounds and specialize in different parts of global history to recover those legacies. And we're actually, I think this is 
this is where your, your keynote uh, makes a particularly valid point. Uh, we are very much used to this canonical um, linear history. And it's not just IR. If you look at, let's say, uh, the history of any particular region or of any particular nation, um, it will be taught around certain sort of novel points, which will most of the time center on one particular order, on one, one particular cultural or civilizational space. You can, you can call it whatever you want. And uh, to some extent, I think um, even scholars from the former colonies, if I'm permitted to use that word, um, are complicit in that because they are so much focused on the former colonizer that uh, they don't really try to recover other legacies that might have shaped, shaped their particular spaces and places and orders. Um, and I, I, I definitely would like to see more, let's say, on the Ottoman legacies uh, in, uh, in, in, in the, what we call post-Soviet space. And Habsburg legacies have, have not been really properly studied. Um, and uh, in that sense, I, I, I guess we just have to do our job. And that's, that's, that's uh, something that uh, is probably still ahead of us. We should not treat the current state of our discipline or of our inter interdisciplinary field or fields as um, fixed once and forever. I think it's, uh, it's something that uh, is very much open. And um, yeah, that, that would be my, my reply to this. But okay, I shouldn't probably take the floor from you. So moving on to the next question. Uh, add one uh, all right, yes, yes, go ahead. I mean, when I think of studying legacies, I mean, in the ideal world, it wouldn't be like, you know, the Soviet Union, always from Moscow, like the legacy, like go into each context and see what the legacy is. But the history ideally would be recovered as kind of a connected history where different parts of the space as part as a result of having been part of the space were connected and also influencing each other. So, I mean, there isn't a similar post Ottoman studies, but <laughs> if it existed, uh, it would be more interesting to see, I think, how like Athens and Cairo were connected than to see like the legacy of like Istanbul in those two places, right? So ideally, <laughs> we would also have a connected understanding of you know what the legacy is that doesn't privilege the center always, but recovers this space uh, as a space uh, that where different actors were influencing each other. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a very valid point. I, I completely agree. Um, so, next question uh, from Siddharth Saxena. Uh, greeting from Cambridge. My question is, in your view, how problematic, um, how problematic fixation with the notion of Westphalian state is uh, inhibiting development of area studies? So, the, the impact, the um, the impact of the concept of Westphalian states or uh, Westphalian states uh, on uh, area studies. Um, yeah, I'm, um, that's a good question. I mean, I haven't really thought of it in that in those terms. But as I said in this book, I'm very interested in rethinking the concept of sovereignty, and I think we need to come up with a more general definition of sovereignty, which is I'm trying, which is what I'm trying to do in this book for different historical, you know, periods and with a more flexible understanding of sovereignty that doesn't, that's not always looking for one particular form, uh, which I think is, you know, what we call West Valian sovereignty is a particular form of sovereignty that belongs to a particular historical period, then yes, I think with a broader flexible definition, um, I, I think all area studies included, all, all <laughs> All aspects of political science and IR will, you know, will benefit. Um, yeah. So um, I guess I mean what what I could say is um, I'm all for you know comparisons and making generalizations. The problem in the way you know the formation of social sciences in the 20th century is they kind of abstracted always uh, from the European experience. And then we started saying, well, you know, this doesn't really travel. Uh, but and some people, as a result, say that we shouldn't do, we shouldn't do any, you know, cross comparisons. Or, uh, but my answer to that problem is no. We need to come up with, you know, better concepts. We need to have more um, historical examples we can draw from, and then hopefully we can, you know, come up with better concepts, including sovereignty, including order. 
um, yeah, so we need to think or rethink some of the building blocks of our uh, social sciences, I think. Uh, yes, uh, again, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, moving to the next question, Stefano Bragiroli. How can we expect instances of de-Europeanization uh, at the EU level? Uh, that is Brexit, populism, uh, so sovereignism, to affect our understanding of regionalism and in particular of uh, regionalism in Eurasia? Can we expect mutual influences and can it help us in some way to better define a region such as Eurasia? So I guess the question is about uh, uh, de-Europeanization and at the same time uh, uh, the importance of Eurasia in this whole context. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, I guess it points to, I mean, one way to read it is it, uh, it suggests, well, at least the Europeanization on the Eastern side suggests that the previous <laughs> regional ordering or, you know, previous constellation or the sphere, the pull of it was still stronger than the, <laughs> what was imposed on it. But that's one, I mean, I don't know if that's true, but I think people, some people might say that. Um, but I think, I mean, the broader point for me is that it points to this idea that um, areas or regions, we should take them seriously for the reasons that I stated, but they are not, um, they're not natural and they're not you know, fixed. And even in our lifetime, there have been, <laughs> I, I mean, we may be living through a particularly fluid or, um, um, you know, um, uh, time with a lot of changes, but I think, you know, it also shows uh, the, the unnaturalness of even Europe, <laughs> the, the region that everybody like takes for granted, even that is, you know, humans make and unmake these regions. Um, yeah, so on the one hand, they're powerful, on the other hand, they're subject to change. And I think that's true for <laughs> a lot of uh, institutions. Yes, uh, in a certain sense, I would even question the notion of de-Europeanization. I understand that Stefano probably means it's also in a, in a certain critical way, but uh, um, it, do we really deal with de-Europeanization or do we, do we deal with the reshaping of Europe in, 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 uh, when, in the shape of Bre Brexit, for instance? Well, definitely, I mean, Britain has, has, has left, but at the same time, what has, um, what has remained is, uh, in a certain sense, more coherent. But at the same time, of course, yes, we know that this, this coherent whole is at the same time moving in different directions and parts are becoming more pronounced. So, yeah, and um, we probably live in more fluid times. But at the same time, I have a feeling that people have been saying that always, that, you know, time, time, time flies and um, things change so quickly. And... Uh, the, 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 it's so unstable and so unpredictable. Um, so I'm not even sure that uh, in that sense, it's, um, it's something new, but um, yeah, well, we'll wait and see. All right, uh, moving on. Um, Ansis Berzinsch, uh, of course, to build a picture of world history from European uh, or West window, quote, quote, unquote, is not objective. But for Asia East, it's more or less the same. Why not to write a book how the world history looks from, for example, windows of uh, the natives of Africa or Australia? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, good point. I, I would love it if somebody wrote that book. Um, I couldn't, <laughs> given, <laughs> given what I know and what uh, I could learn. Um, but I do make the point in the book that there are many other histories to be told. And I'm looking at one kind of world ordering that international relations has been interested in. So I'm trying to join the existing conversation as it is. I, might, I may not like the conversation, but in order to be also you know, heard, you kind of <laughs> have to, you know, <laughs> you join the, you know, the, the conversation as it has taken shape. And this is how I'm doing it, moving the field a little bit, hopefully. And then others hopefully will move the field even more and look at different kinds of orders and different kinds of conceptions of order and all, all that. I'm all for that. 
uh, and I, I underlined that in the book. So I'm, it's just one piece of the puzzle. It's not, you know, uh, with its own shortcomings, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I, definitely uh, should be an invitation more than a, 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 you know, an attempt to say a final word. I, I would definitely agree with that. Uh, by the way, uh, regarding this region in particular, I have had a number of times quite an interesting experience with uh, reviewers and also editors of journals when um, if you use Eastern Europe as your case to illustrate, let's say, a theoretical point in an article, then some, quite often, most of the time, you will get accused of Eurocentrism. Because uh, Eastern Europe is considered part of Europe in that sense. But at the same time, we of course all know that uh, in many respects, uh, the second world is still there. So when, um, uh, uh, when someone assumes that uh, uh, Eastern Europe or Central and Eastern Europe, or even Central and Eastern Europe and R Russia have been integrated into something that we can call Europe or the North or, or, or whatever, global capitalist core, that is of course a very wrong assumption, I would say. And uh, the unevenness is still very much there. So in that sense, even focusing on this region um, can sometimes decenter a Eurocentric perspective, but uh, yeah, at the same time, yes, I, I definitely very much welcome also the the uh, idea that we need to open up and uh, write history from other non-European perspectives, from something that uh, has not been part of our horizon for, uh, let's say, well, maybe forever, maybe never was, uh, maybe it, it has become part of our intellectual debate only in the recent two, three decades. Um, next question comes from Sanshiro Osaka. Uh, thank you for the thought-provoking talk. Uh, you asked if Russia and Eastern Europe should be studied together. In my view, Russia must be studied in the context of Eastern Europe. In my country, Japan, in 2014, a lot of scholars of Russian studies subscribe, subscribe to Putin's narratives or other uh, Russian experts' views on Ukraine without criticism. Uh, if scholars of Russian studies knew the history of Ukraine a bit better, or the history of the Baltic countries, the peripheries of the past empire in general, mm -hmm. things would have been different. Future students must study the peripheries of Russia from their viewpoints, not through the prism of Moscow. This issue will be discussed in depth tomorrow at the roundtable on Russian studies in crisis. What is your take on this? No, sounds, I mean, sounds really good. I, I, I agree. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that's a good comment. Uh, that's another reason, yes. Um, yeah, um, another uh, point from uh, Prajakti Kaura. I think it's not a, a, a question this time. It's more a follow-up. Uh, European is pushed as universal, which is what a lot of us are uncomfortable with at this point. Uh, well, I don't know if you have any reactions or... Yeah, um, I, I, I completely agree. Um, um, so, um, you're, yeah, there, there are certain universal dynamics that we can also find in Europe and elsewhere. <laughs> so that is my take. Uh, but European history or experience it in itself uh, is not uh, universal. Um, and in fact, what one of the things I was, you know, trying to do in this book that I finished, I, I have a chapter where I talk about Asian and Eurasian influences on Europe. So I, I make the argument that European history as we know it wouldn't have happened had Europe not been on the periphery of this larger um, uh, order. Uh, so yeah, I think we need to, to think about history, international relations history or global history as connected and not emanating from one region or another. Um, and yeah, and I, I think we'll, we'll all be better for it once you know we can get there. It's just We've been thinking about the world also, you know, because of national histories kind of reproduce these kind of narratives. We've been thinking about the world a particular way since like the 19th century. So it's very difficult uh, to, you know, I use the, sometimes use the example. It's not like, you know, building a, there's building a new house from scratch, but 
I think the situation we find ourselves in with Eurocentrism is like you're in this old house and they're like layers of like wallpaper. <laughs> and so you have to like keep stripping those old layers of wallpaper, which takes much, I mean, if we built the disciplines now from scratch, I don't think, you know, with what we know now, we would have these, but we have to work with what exists and what people are taught in schools and primary schools. So it's layer upon layer. So, you know, uh, and it's always, you're always falling short in some ways, uh, but again, we do the best we can. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, I would also like to react to that and maybe bring in one more point, uh, which hasn't really yet uh, been uh, thrown in, in, into this debate. But uh, before I do that, let me just remind the participants once again that if you want to ask uh, a question, uh, you should go to the agenda on the right side of your browser window and then uh, there choose today's session and uh, there, there is a button Q&A for that. We definitely could still take a couple of uh, couple more questions, but um, uh, the point that I uh, that actually came to, came to my mind uh, when um, I was listening to you uh, and, and your answers to all these questions um, is about um, capitalism, because of course um, uh, one reason why. Uh, we live in a world where Europe has monopolized, or you can say hegemonized the idea of universality is exactly because it was the point of origin of capitalist development. And this is, this is how it came to rule the world. And maybe this is how it eventually will lose its central role in the world because capitalism will become more dynamic, more efficient elsewhere, maybe, we don't know, but uh, looks that, like it's not an implausible scenario. Um, and um, in that sense, I've always been uh, actually arguing that, um, yes, we, we should look at the center periphery dynamic um, in, and, and, and at uh, unevenness and inequality in the world. And your research has always, also been on hierarchies and um, uh, on, on how the liberal world order, despite the pretends to be egalitarian and, uh, and uh, based on uh, the principles of uh, uh, sovereign equality and so on, it's still, uh, of course, very hierarchical. Um, so um, does capitalism play any role in your analysis? Um... Not so much, but it's def definitely, I mean, it's, I have to think about, you know, trade networks and so on. I, for me, I, I would say European advantage is not so much about capitalism, uh, but rather the industrial revolution, the industrial capitalism, I think is what makes the difference because I subscribe to more the California school views that sees <laughs> the divergence happening late 18th or early 19th century. Uh, I think there were forms of capitalism elsewhere uh, and maybe the industrial revolution could have happened elsewhere. I don't think it was anything specific about, you know, European culture or whatever that made. So I don't subscribe to <laughs> that, that view. Um, yeah. And, you know, uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, sorry. <laughs> so capitalism is in, is in the background of my analysis but it's not such a big factor in the time period that I was looking at. Um, but I would say definitely it should be uh, <laughs> now, it should be part of any analysis. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, I, I didn't mean specifically in this case, in, in, in that book that we were discussing, uh, but more generally in, in, in your view of um, global history. Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely, I mean, I, yeah, I think, we should be, you know, I try, I started much more interested in studying uh, the ideational side of international relations, uh, partly maybe as a reaction to what <laughs> existed in the field. Uh, I thought this was being underemphasized. But uh, as I've, you know, as I've gotten, you know, immersed in my own research and added like historical periods and so on. Now I'm much more, you know, um, agnostic. You know, so I think sometimes we need to look at, you know, material <laughs> dynamics. Sometimes ideational. I'm, I don't think, you know, what, what becomes really determinative. Uh, I, it's almost like an empirical question rather than like an ideological position. It's all, all ideas, all, 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 all material. So, 
um, I'm I'm a more <laughs> I have a more pragmatist view of these debates that seem to be more so important when we were you know in grad school. Um, yeah. Okay, we have one more question uh, from Lelda Arnisane. Um, thank you for the talk, uh, she writes. Uh, you mentioned uh, the variety of area conferences you have been part of. Could that be the reason to have a more favorable view? Uh, <laughs> considering that the criticism of uh, inwardness and limited general perspectives would still be valid, what, what would be uh, the place and position to really take advantage from area studies? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess there's an implicit criticism in there that it's easy for me to say I just keep <laughs> coming in, in and out. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I think I would encourage, I mean, what I said about interdisciplinarity, I think it also applies to area studies, like to the extent that one can read outside of their own area. I think that is also gener uh, generative of new ideas. Um, yeah, um, I mean, I don't know that there is necessarily a, a strategy to this, but I always tell my own PhD students, you know, don't just read what you think you need to read, <laughs> read things that you <laughs> think you don't need to read. <laughs> and uh, that's true about theories, about schools, about other disciplines, about other areas. Um, it's good to have a home, like my home is international relations. It kind of anchors me, I'm interested. I mean, I find a lot of international relations tedious or boring, but at the same time, I'm interested in the big debates that are happening in international relations. Uh, there are things about it that suit me. I think for all of us, it's similar. Like you find a home, but then every now and then it's good to go on like <laughs> on a trip, like, you know, on a vacation <laughs> to, <laughs> to another area or like another uh, theoretical discussion or something. And I think it's good for um, it's good for our thinking, it's good for our scholarship to explore to ourselves to different things. Yeah, I, I, I agree, although actually I, I'm starting to think whether you can be on a permanent vacation <laughs> uh, if you get completely interdisciplinary and spend all of your time just moving between disciplines. So. Yes. All right, well, I guess, um, I guess it's time to um, draw a line here. Uh, so Aisha, thank you very much for this very inspiring talk, which is also very encouraging to our team, all the people who organized this conference, because indeed um, you, you, you gave just a, a huge boost to our self-confidence um, as uh, people who in this case, uh, try to promote area studies uh, in this particular region, but at the same time to keep it open and also invite people to do not just interdisciplinary, but also cross-regional studies and uh, comparative analysis and uh, bringing global uh, points as well. So thank you very much um, and um, um, to other participants, we start at 9 a.m. tomorrow with panel sessions. Um, and as I said already, I am very much looking forward to uh, the discussions tomorrow. So please, um, um, well, I mean, we cannot, uh, uh, we, we, we cannot applaud you, I share, um, in, in, real, in real world, but I'm sure everyone is applauding in front of their screens right now. Thank you very much. And thank you for the excellent questions. Um, and I hope we get to meet in person one day. Yes, sure. Um, let's do that.